Yes, thank you very much, Ray, for the introduction and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, today I will be talking about uh, ALCF Jupyter Hub and how we can use it for basically interactive high performance computing, which can be lower the barriers uh, for uh, HPC access and also increase productivity. Um, so let me start by giving a brief outline. Um, I had a similar talk in 2020, uh, almost exactly three years, three years ago. Uh, so there are many developments on the Jupyter side. There are many developments on the ALCF side. So I would like to give an overview of the 2020 presentation with the caveats about the new changes and so on. And then mention specific developments in Jupyter compare JupyterLab versus Jupyter Notebook um, to motivate you about using more on JupyterLab and uh, have a discussion on uh, JupyterHub on TetaGP and Polaris. And I will demonstrate the features of JupyterLab and JupyterHub for Polaris uh, with some live demonstration. So, uh, let, and before getting started, I would like to um, encourage you to interrupt me either by asking questions on the chat or even speak up. Uh, it, it will be much productive, I think, for all of us if it is more interactive. Uh, the content I have here, mostly available in documentations and so on. So with asking questions that you need the answers for, we can uh, really make it more useful. So um, Jupyter Project is a one of the projects I really admire in terms of the community effort that is going there and the uh, attention it received uh, and the productivity it engaged in many uh, scientists. So the project started in 2014 and the goal at the beginning is basically still the goal. The, it is, the idea is to develop a software development environment, open standards and services for interactive computing. And this, this, it was inspired by the Galileo's network, net notebooks and uh, because he has very notebooks that has lots of visual information. Uh, so Jupyter Notebook uh, name came from there. While main focus will be on Python here, it is available in different kernels which support uh, different um, programming languages. And I see already a question about the slides and video recording. Yes, these will be shared uh, on the event website. They will be available. And most all the content that I present is actually also available on GitHub, and I will provide the link. So Jupyter Notebook is mostly famous with the notebooks, but uh, Jupyter Lab is a full-featured development environment that where you can run your Jupyter Notebooks along with many different file types. Um, Jupyter Hub is the basically the server where many users can um, use the same Jupyter instance uh, with their custom environments. And there are other developments on the Jupyter community like Jupyter Book, uh, Voila, where you specify where you create a standalone app and so on. Um, you can find all of these in the Jupyter website. So what you can do with Jupyter? Uh, as I mentioned, this is the main goal is to have an interactive development environment for scientific workflows, um, mainly, uh, but it is used in industry uh, engineering in uh, many different areas. So it, it has really a wide um, range of um, users. So it allows fast code prototyping. So it, it, you can use it for code development and you can uh, test new ideas very easily. As I mentioned, not Python is while the main language uh, that is the most common language used. Uh, other Jupyter kernels for C++, Fortran, Rust um, are all available. Um, it became a very useful tool for education. One can prep tutorials and run, do run demos, uh, demonstrations as I will demonstrate today uh, with Jupyter notebooks and uh, one can even grade assignments with one Jupyter extension, uh, MB Grader. There are many other tools that can help in the education aspect like the interactive widgets and so on. 
Um, it is used a lot in the data analysis and visualization. And I would say for the last uh, five years, the main development comes from the push, push from the um, machine learning community because they find this tool very useful for their workflows. Um, you can even prepare presentations. Here, the presentation I have is actually a Jupyter notebook uh, running in Jupyter Lab. Uh, this RISE uh, tool is basically using the reveal ju just, uh, JavaScript. And um, you can use Jupyter Hub on the HPC centers. So this is, I think, one of the most important developments in the last five years, getting more attention. Now Jupyter Hub is available on um, almost all major supercomputer centers. Uh, Google Colab is one of the Jupyter-based uh, uh, collaboration environment, uh, and they Google basically uh, serves all their cloud computing uh, through this uh, Jupyter Access. Binder is another way where you can run Jupyter notebooks uh, on the cloud. And this can be put on your Google uh, um, GitHub repos and so on. And many other um, cloud, com cloud companies are using uh, Jupyter notebooks from uh, Microsoft uh, to IBM and so, so on. Um, so to make the product, to make you more productive on with Jupyter notebook, uh, you can use various shortcuts. Since many people are more used to the common line environment in the scientific computing area, shortcuts can be uh, very important. Uh, so all the features that Jupyter notebook, Jupyter lab provides you, you can uh, enhance your productivity with these shortcuts. Um, but there is a small caveat here. Jupyter Lab doesn't support all the shortcuts Jupyter Notebook supports. Uh, the specific example, the specific ones that I am aware of are this H, which, which shows the uh, help for the shortcuts that's not available. Uh, for F, for the search, instead of F, you can use Command or Control F. This is for search and replace. Um, so this to display the command palette instead of uh, E, you have to use uh, Shift Command C or Shift Control C. Uh, so these are basic stuff. One of the advantages of Jupyter is basically you can use markdown text uh, to make your, for example, tutorials more um, user friendly. And you know, markdown list, markdown text, and available uh, makes available uh, various uh, text features. Like you can have your bullet list, you can have your latex type, latex type equations, you can have inline code, you can have a code block, which can be highlighted based on what type of code it is. Uh, it supports all different codes from C++, Fortran to Bash scripts. You can put links, you can put generate a table, uh, you can display pictures. So these are basically features that makes again um, Jupyter Notebooks useful. One thing that is not as commonly used, but uh, I, I think that very useful are the IPython magics. So I, um, in both Jupyter Lab and Jupyter Notebook, there are line magics, which can be used with a person sign and cell magics, which should be applicable to the whole cell uh, with double person signs. Uh, one difference for the cell magic is that uh, this double person should be at the first line and not that whatever the magic does is applicable to the whole set. Uh, another useful feature in Jupyter Notebooks is basically uh, you can run shell commands by putting an exclamation mark before the command. Um, and there are various magics that you can uh, use of. The ones that I find useful are the debugging uh, for interactive debugging on uh, Jupyter Lab. Uh, time it basically enables you to see the time to take the uh, for the cell or more specific profiling tools like PRUN or LP runs. Um, for example, if you type this and let's show this, you will see uh, some information about the magic that is available. Um, Okay, let's go back. So as you see, but the, all the presentation is in Jupyter Hub here. 
and I'm basically rendering it and you see the rendered version. Um, so Jupyter widgets are another very useful tool uh, which provides basically graphical user interface. Um, I see one question. I see that the question is asking if we can use uh, with LaTeX. Um, I am not sure if there is a specific LaTeX kernel, but you can display LaTeX type equations in Markdown text. Um, and I will basically, in the demo, I will show you an example for that. Um, yeah, this uh, widgets are basically these buttons that you can use, uh, buttons, sliders, drop down menus, and so on, uh, that you can create and make your Jupyter notebook more interactive for particularly for education purpose or uh, to simplify the user interface um, if you are preparing a de demonstration. So uh, ALCF Jupyter Hub is basically available to all ALCF users. Uh, you can go to jupyter.alcf.anl.gov and sign into the specific Jupyter Hub server. Uh, right now, it is available for Cooley, Theta, Theta GPU, and Polaris. So um, this slide is from 2020. I will have the updated one. Uh, I will show. So this is only showing Cooley and Theta. But the caveat here is Cooley and Theta is going to retire at the end of this year. So I would strongly suggest using uh, either Theta GPU or Polaris. Um, in the past, when I was presenting in three years ago, our Jupyter Hub instances were running on external servers, but they were not available on compute nodes. Now they are available on the Polaris and Theta GPU compute nodes as well. Um, so these are notes about the Cooley and Theta, but I will pass this since these are not important anymore. Um, some carryouts again about using Jupyter Hub. And it starts on your home folder to access project folders. Um, you can create a symbolic link in your home folder and then access those project folders. Uh, sometimes we see some uh, users getting this permission denied errors when they sign in on the Jupyter Hub. This might be probably you have uh, broken uh, links, uh, symbolic links in your home directory. Uh, so if you fix those, the problem will be fixed automatically. And there are also sometimes problems when you exit your file quota uh, on your home directory. Again, Jupyter Hub may not be accessible and so on. So, um, and another thing to note, Right now, Theta G, uh, Jupyter Hub for Polaris automatically launches Jupyter Lab. On the other hand, Jupyter Hub for Theta GPU uh, starts with the classic Jupyter Notebook interface. But even if when you start with the classic notebook interface, you can uh, use the uh, lab by basically just modifying the link at the end and add this uh, slash lab. And documentation is now available under uh, on this web page. So, one of the most important uh, areas to customize your environment when you are running Python applications and using Jupyter Hub is basically to develop a virtual environment for your uh, env for, for your specific needs. Uh, what are these virtual environments? These are basically isolated environments that allows you to install Python libraries and packages without interfering with either the system packages or um, the packages that, uh, the, or the specific applications that you are interested in. So you may have different runtime environments for, for example, for data analysis, uh, for chemistry simulation, or for any other task that you are interested in. And uh, these environments, since there are many Python dependencies for each of them, uh, this will avoid the conflicts with each other. So it's a very good practice to develop uh, these virtual environments, to create these virtual environments for your specific uh, workflow. There are two tools that are very common. Uh, these are VN and Conda. VN is 
basically available in the Python standard library since the version 3.3. Uh, this basically creates a virtual environment with its own Python library um, and uh, Python binary and the libraries. And you, it, it installs packages in the uh, site directories. The way to create an uh, environment is very simple. You use Python uh, or Python 3-mvn, and then you write the name of the uh, virtual environment. So this will be the name, or you can specify the full path. Because if you type this in a directory, this will be created in that directory. If you want it to be in another directory, you have to specify the full path to that directory, and then the environment will be created there. And the name of the environment will be basically the name of the directory. Um, after you create the directory or the environment, then you can activate it by basically launching the activate binary inside the bin directory within the environment. Uh, following this, you can install packages with pip. Uh, however, note that VN is uh, specific to Python packages. On the other end, there is this Conda utility, which can manage both package management and environment management. This is developed by Anaconda. Uh, and it can handle libraries, packages from any languages, not just Python. So this is one advantage of Conda, but it also makes it more complicated and um, sometimes very slow when you are trying to install or creating an environment with lots of dependencies. Um, you can either install your own Miniconda and Miniconda um, by following the instructions given there. Or what we recommend would be to use the Conja modules installed on our systems. These modules basically have uh, all the libraries or important packages installed in them. So you won't have the problem of finding the right driver for the uh, software. Uh, this can be easily done by module with the module load Conda command. You can also search for different Conda modules by module avail conda, and uh, you can then install the latest version by looking at the uh, name of the modules. After you load the module, you can create a new environment um, by basically uh, following these instructions. And, there are, and the advantage of this conda environment is that you can use either conda install or pip install. It supports uh, both installations. And there are many more information online. Uh, for Theta GPU specific instructions are also available in our documentation, and Polaris instructions are also available in our uh, documentation. Uh, so I'm just checking for questions. Okay, I don't see anything. Um, one of the things we recommend again for the uh, just to improve your experience, since there might be a lot of system specific packages that you may need to install correctly to uh, use either CUDA driver or um, MPI for Pi and MPI related um, libraries. So what we suggest is cloning our base Conda environment. You can do this either with VM or with Conda. Um, with Conda, this is basically done after you lo load the module, you do Conda activate. This will activate the base environment. And then uh, with the, you can install your virtual environment with this um, argument, system side packages. So this will install the system side packages. And then you can activate your environment and install the packages that you want. If some of the packages are installed already. Uh, there are specific attributes you can specify to ignore that uh, that installed package, but uh, it will your new package will be installed alongside with that, and your new package will be the default one. Uh, if you want to do this with Conda uh, to be more flexible, 
you can do so with the, uh, this conducrate dash dash clone base. And then you need to specify the prefix where the installation will happen. So note that you do not specify a name here, and you cannot. Uh, but the name of the uh, new Conda environment will be basically the name of the directory where it is installed. What I would suggest is to choose a path within um, in your project directory. The reason for that is Conda environments can easily reach uh, many tens of gigabytes. And if you have many of them, you will clutter your home directory. Um, so you can put this in your project directory and then have much uh, less problems with the uh, with your code. So after that, you can activate the environment by specifying the path to the directory and then follow on as usual with the installation of the packages that you want. Uh, but one thing you need to be careful here is when you're installing a package, let's say you want to install TensorFlow, but this is TensorFlow is already installed. You will see that it will basically erase the installed version and install the new one. So you have to be careful uh, about this feature because when you make a new installation, you may lose the advantage of the, uh, the base environment where all the drivers are specifically picked. So after this, uh, once you have your custom environment, how you can use on the Jupyter app. This is the most important part for this talk. And this is done with by installing the IPython kernels. IPython kernels are basically what you see in the Jupyter environment uh, as the kernels. Um, first thing to do is you have to make sure IPy kernel package is installed in your environment. If you are using one of our modules, this should be installed automatically. This should be available there. So you won't probably need this first step. Uh, but nothing wrong with running it. And if it is installed, it will not give you any problem. Um, after installing the IPython kernel, and um, for that, you have to make sure you are in the right environment. So first, make sure that you activated the Conda environment or the virtual environment that you are in, and make sure that uh, you, in you install this package, which is available. And then you can install the custom kernel with the following command. So Basically, with this command, you will see a custom kernel name as the one as one of the available kernels on Jupyter. Uh, this name can be uh, anything; it doesn't need to be the same name with your environment. However, uh, I it would be suggested to keep the environment name and the custom kernel name same so that you don't you will have a better understanding of what the uh, what the environment is entitled to and you can have this name verbose um, by putting this dash dash display name uh, and specifying um, in a more um, longer name with spaces and so on like where this is installed for maybe it is for polaris or theta gp specifying it can be useful um, which Python uh, version you are using, or if you are using a specific TensorFlow version, uh, specifying that can be useful as well. Or you can put all of them under your custom kernel name as well, but make sure you don't have any spaces there. Um, another important part while installing the kernels is uh, the environment variables that can be launched when you launch the IPython kernel. Uh, this can be uh, tricky for various uh, re reasons, because sometimes for some packages, um, you, 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 your cost, on your cost, con, um, Conda environment or a virtual environment with VM, you see that the program is running. But when you go to Jupyter Hub and uh, using the right kernel, you still cannot run the same program. This might be because some environment variables are missing. And another important part is when you're running on our compute nodes, there is no internet access by default. So you have to specify the certain environment variables to get to, uh, to, to, for the internet to be available. So to do that, for example, you can either specify with dash dash n attribute uh, argument, the uh, environment name and the value for that, 
you can do it as many as the environment variables that you would like to port into the kernel. Um, but you can also do this afterwards. So let's say you create your kernel. Uh, this kernel will be installed um, under dot local share Jupyter kernels. And you can basically see this, all the kernels with this command Jupyter kernel spec list. Uh, there should be a dash here. Let's fix this. Um, So I have to render it to see it here, but okay, let's go continue. Um, and once you see that, you can find the all the specifications, all the configuration for this kernel is located in the kernel.json file in the kernel directory. For example, for this example, the file will be uh, in this path. And the information you will see, for example, um, for this one that I created is, um, this is my project directory where I have my environment, which is a Conda clone. And uh, the display name I choose is displayed here. I can edit this. So this kernel.json file is basically a text file where you can edit with your um, um, favorite editor. And here you see the environment variable. So since this is the JSON, you see this uh, dictionary type syntax where you have the key and the value separated with the column. And don't forget the um, quotation marks. And you can specify the environment variable and the value in this fashion. One of the things I do is basically I use uh, th these, these are, um, these variables are very important. This CUDA home uh, or this GPU support enabled and these are, for example, you can copy all these and put this in your environment. And um, th this will basically eliminate all the problems that you may have about uh, CUDA driver mismatch and so on. So this is one useful feature about the kernel.json file is editable. And once you edit it, you can immediately see the effect once you refresh uh, the uh, kernel, uh, the web page, um, Jupyter Hub web page that you're running. Um, as I mentioned, there might be problems if you are using many different Conda environments that can take a lot of space, these virtual environments. So you can uh, do some cleanups uh, with the following these commands. And you can find more information about um, Jupyter Online. There are really a lot of resources that can help you uh, when you are stuck with some basic problems. Okay, I see a question. Uh, let me try to read. Okay. Um, I, I will, there are a lot of questions. So one question is uh, from Mahendra. Can we test these functions virtual and uh, these functions on Google Colab? So on Google Colab, um, you don't need to specify, you not, you don't need to uh, create a virtual environment yourself. When you are on the Google Colab environment, you can customize it um, by basically installing stuff with pip or conda. Uh, the trick there is you have to use uh, the pip magic or the conda magic with the person pip sign or the person conda sign conda uh, uh, magic. So this will allow you uh, install any packages on Google Colab. We will call it unless it is modifying some system specific uh, stuff. Um, so, uh, uh, Sage is asking, uh, I am, is, uh, uh, should we not use dash dash name and use dash dash prefix? So, if you do use conda create dash dash name and specify the name of the environment, this will basically create a conda environment under your home directory. So this is fine, but the problem is that you can increase, uh, you can basically uh, have the size uh, quota problem. Uh, and I, I don't think you can clone without the prefix uh, argument. So I would suggest using the prefix argument and uh, do not specify. And when you use actually that prefix argument, you cannot specify any. This is not allowed. 
Um, another question, Fonda, folders like uh, from Dario, uh, fol folders like conduct.conda.cache are in, when you have many environments with different packages, they start to grow and might be run. Yeah. Uh, okay, what would you recommend to do that? Yes, I think I answered this question. There is There are some conduct cleanup commands. You can search for that. I also give it in the, uh, I, here. So there's conda clean. If you do uh, conda clean dash dash help, you can see the available options. This conda clean dash dash all dash y basically cleans up all the cache. Uh, but there might be some specific stuff that you might be interested interested in or keeping some of the cached directories um, and check for the uh, options there. Um, and Hamad is asking. Um, as Polaris debug queue has a wall time limit of one hour, does the same wall time limits are applicable if you are using Jupyter Hub on Polaris? Yes, and I will specifically mention this problem. Um, this is a yeah, this is a limiting factor. Uh, can Jupyter notebook be used for production or just for development? Well, I am using it for production. I have, um, I have created many plots uh, just using Jupyter notebooks um, or run workflows for my simulations and so on. Uh, you can create pro uh, publication quality graphs. Um, and actually, some journals, uh, if you have some uh, specific workflows, you can upload your Jupyter notebook um, on GitHub with the environment specified. And this can give a reproducible environment how you can reproduce, uh, for example, the results of your paper. So this is actually a common practice in um, different domains. So I think these are all the questions so far. Um, so let me go to the, um, where I stopped. So I have described um, the main stuff about Jupyter Hub, Jupyter Lab. Uh, so I would like to give you some updates um, so the, all the content that I have talked um, have been modified, but you can also go back to the uh, 2020 webinar and look at the YouTube video uh, and see more for explanations about uh, the points that I raised. So now I would like to jump to uh, what happened after 2020 and what are the specific new developments. So one of the new features um, on Jupyter Lab and it's also now available on Jupyter Notebook 7.0, is real-time collaboration. Now, two persons can edit the same Jupyter Notebook. You can see the cursors of different persons uh, by basically installing this package, Jupyter Collaboration. Um, this is not available on Jupyter Hub yet, but this is a feature that will be available uh, on our uh, machines all, as well. There is a visual debugger, which can be very helpful if you are debugging a, uh, problem in your code. Now the Jupyter Lab performance is much better. And there are many useful uh, extensions for Jupyter Lab, like the Git extensions, uh, the MB Dime extension, which is very useful to do the version control to diff two different Jupyter notebooks. There is a Jupyter AI extension, which I will demonstrate, where basically you can use large language models to help you while running your Jupyter notebook. And you can have some dashboards, like NVIDIA has a GPU utilization uh, dashboard. And Jupyter Lab, normally you run it on browser. There is now also a standalone desktop version where you can install, uh, which basically can be a standalone application. So these are the major developments I have seen in the uh, Jupyter uh, in the last three years. So many people still just use Jupyter Notebook. I would strongly encourage to switch to Jupyter Lab um, because on Jupyter Lab you can do whatever you do on Jupyter Notebook with very small caveats, um, and you can do much more. So basically, Jupyter Lab provides a real IDE, like uh, the inter uh, it provides a very interact interactive development environment where you can just uh, where you can manage multiple notebooks, terminals, and other file types like CSV files, JSON files, um, PDF files, HTML files, um, or JPEG files or images. And it has a very modular and extensible design. And um, every it is very often to see a new extension that can basically improve your productivity. 
Um, this is thanks to its flexible and um, responsive user interface that makes you basically more productive. You can drag and drop cells to the, between different notebooks and so on, which are things that you cannot do in a Jupyter notebook. Um, so right now, most of the Jupyter developers are working on the lab notebook, Jupyter notebook development basically makes use of the Jupyter lab developments as well, since these are basically developed under the same, uh, mostly the same people are doing these developments, uh, but they put major effort on the Jupyter lab side. So uh, switching to Jupyter lab basically gives you more features earlier. Jupyter notebook adapts the features later than Jupyter lab. Um, so the, another new thing for ASCF side is the Theta GPU Jupyter Hub. So we have uh, the J Jupyter Hub instance for Theta GPU in two different ways. One can be um, to access Theta GPU job management through an external server. This is very similar to this. This is the same server basically that is used for Cooley and Theta, but now you can access basically Theta, theta GPU um, Two servers. Alternatively, you can directly launch on Theta GPU compute nodes. Theta GPU compute nodes has less restrictions about the time, so these can be a better productive uh, uh, production environment for you. Since, as I will mention, for Polaris, the queue times are more, much more limited. However, the right now this will be updated soon. Right, but right now, the Jupyter instance running is older than the Jupyter instance for Polaris, Polaris Jupyter Hub. Um, and by the default, it is launching the Jupyter Notebook instance, which you can uh, edit. Uh, you can change by just editing the uh, URL to we'll go to Jupyter Lab. Um, so once you try to launch a job on launch Theta GPU on the compute node, uh, you will come across with these options, these server options. So here you can specify the queue that you would like to run the job and you can see the minimum time and the maximum time allowed there. So you should specify your runtime based on that. Um, and then you have to specify what kind of project you are using. Uh, all your projects should appear in this drop-down menu. And after that, you can click start and then you will see that uh, it will, your job will enter the queue, but it may take time uh, to basically launch the server on the queue since the queue may be long, Qu queue might be long. If the wait time is long, you will be basically kicked out of the uh, server and you have to try again at a later time. So this is one of the annoying part about running Jupyter Hub right now when the queue depth is uh, long. Um, similarly, we have Jupyter Hub for Polaris, but there are many dif some differences on Polaris compared to Theta GPU. Although uh, Theta GPU and Polaris both uses NVIDIA 800 GPUs, there are some differences. Theta GPU uses Cobalt job scheduler, Polaris uses PBS job scheduler. And since this is going to be the job scheduler for Aurora upcoming exascale supercomputer for ASCF, uh, uh, we would like. Uh, th this will be more important to learn in the future. So uh, the job options menu is very similar. Um, I will, uh, you again select your job profile, you select your queue name, your project list, and then uh, you, you specify the number of nodes and runtime. Uh, you have to also specify the file systems. Automatically, it checks all the uh, file systems, but depending on what you want, you can reduce that. Uh, the difficulty is, again, the uh, runtime and the queue wait times. So, OK, with all that said, I will start the demonstration after checking if there are any more questions. I don't see any questions, um, so let's Let's start with um, Jupyter Lab demonstration. So I will um, 
close this. And first, let's, let me show you how a typical JupyterLab environment is. So when you basically launch, your, launch the JupyterLab, this is not JupyterHub. This is on my local uh, laptop. I would like to show the features, some features here, because JupyterLab extensions are enabled on my JupyterLab. On the other hand, on our JupyterHub servers, these extensions are not enabled yet. So this is another feature that is coming, upcoming. Um, so I would like to talk to you about uh, some useful extensions. One of the, I think, most useful ones is uh, this Git extension. The Git, if you are familiar with using Git uh, version control system, you will see that this can be very helpful. For example, here I can see um, all the uh, changes I can, for example, I have updated my Jupyter Hub. I can, by clicking this, I can see the difference. So this was not available in the past. So this is a very nice feature with MB Dime. You can visually see what are different, what are the different parts in the two notebooks. So this is uh, after my updates on the Jupyter Hub. Um, I have a new output here. Uh, and so, so you can see all the different changes here. Um, and after seeing those, you can either um, commit this, uh, stage these changes. So by basically putting this now, um, By clicking the plus sign, you can stage the changes. And then uh, you can say update Jupyter Hub, uh, Jupyter Hub webinar. And then you can commit it. And this is still on my local. And then I can basically push it to the repo. So this is, I think, a very useful uh, extension that can help you on uh, Git-based workflows. And there are many other features that you can uh, find it out about Git. Another extension is GitHub extension. This is basically a read-only GitHub repo access. Uh, if there are some repositories that you are interested in, uh, there are some notebooks there, you can basically run uh, these notebooks um, uh, locally on your machine. But any modifications you make will not be saved in the GitHub repo, but locally on your machine uh, by saving uh, whatever folder you want to save it in. So this is just useful to test, for example, different tutorials from different people. You can put the repo username, organization name here, and then it will print out all the repos, uh, all the public repos under that uh, repository. So this is another useful extension. Another one, uh, which is, um, I would say very cool. Uh, this basically Jupyter AI enables, uh, I can show you the web page for this. So this is basically supporting large language models, generative AI models uh, within Jupyter Hub, uh, within Jupyter Lab. Um, you can um, ask questions. Uh, here, for example, let me show you what I have done. Um, I ask how I how do I create a PDF file using Rice with Jupyter Lab for my presentation. So then it created this uh, information. The, the, these are not guaranteed to be correct. Um, you can there is some settings in Mold where you specify the which model you are using. Depending on the large language model you are using, the, your answers might be garbage or can be useful. Uh, I, if you use GPT-4, I have found many answers to be very useful. Um, you can uh, also, for example, do use this slash generate a notebook that uh, this, this is a specific keyword for Jupyter AI, a notebook that demonstrates plotting with Matlib. Use widgets to make this plus interactive. After I did this, uh, let me see where this is. 
Maybe no. Yeah, uh, not this one. Yeah. Um, yeah, floating with, sorry, it's here. So for example, this notebook is generated by the Jupyter AI. Uh, you can see, I, I have tested this, all of them are working. Um, it, it created some widgets and so on. So th this, these are, there are some very nice features, but I don't want to uh, spend more on more time with this. Um, another thing you can do, for example, here, you can use it directly on the Jupyter Notebook. You don't need to use this uh, UI. You can use it on your Jupyter Notebook by using, again, magics. This uh, percent percent AI, chat GPT, for example, I asked to create an equation. So this is a LaTeX equation, LaTeX equation that was asked earlier. You can demonstrate it here. You can create a new code, uh, ask it to write a code, and so on. So this is uh, one um, another ex useful extension. So let's now go to Jupyter Hub. Um, so if we go to jupiter.alcf.anl.gov, this is a screen that we will see. You can log into Polaris or log in Theta GPU. So this is the menu that you will see. Um, and if I click Theta GPU compute node, uh, one thing on Theta GPU, you can only run on a single node. Uh, you can select the queue that you want and so on. Um, so, oh, right now, I already, I'm already on um, the Polaris Jupyter app to make this demonstration. So let me start with uh, demonstrating since we have 10 minutes, I will continue uh, with this demonstration. So here, what I will demonstrate is after loading my kernel, uh, by basically following the instructions I mentioned, also available on our uh, documentation. I created a kernel uh, basically based on the Conda 2023-10-04 module. After that, I, I can install any additional module that I want directly on Jupyter Notebook. And one of the things I would suggest, so let's restart this kernel. Uh, one of the things I would suggest for every notebook, uh, start with these two uh, magics. This will basically enable um, access uh, to any changes in the um, packages that you have done. So these changes will be automatically reflected um, if you use these person signs, uh, these magics. And having the Python version and the environment is a good, I think, um, routine for uh, for every notebook. And then you can see the Jupyter version, but note that this Jupyter is the custom Jupyter on my environment, which is not the same Jupyter used on um, the Jupyter Hub. So Jupyter Hub is 3.5.3, the Jupyter that is installed in the Conda environment, which is basically not used here in this server, uh, has a different version. So for example, the package that I am interested in IPy Parallel was not installed on the default Conda module. So I had to install it with this person sign. Since I already have it, uh, this will basically say that it is available. So the, yes, requirement already satisfied. Um, then I have this very simple code to demonstrate I can run on multiple uh, GPUs. So here you see, whenever you install something, you may need to restart the kernel to use updated packages. This may be necessary or not. Uh, to restart the kernel, you can basically just do this. Um, or if that doesn't work, try refreshing the browser. So here, let's run this example to demonstrate how we can run an MPI example um, on different ranks. And this will also make a sanity check for your environment if it can use MPI uh, correctly. So here, IPI uh, Parallel um, is launched with four engines. 
and you can see there are four different ranks and uh, everything ran correctly. And this is basically to demonstrate that I am on a uh, Polaris uh, compute node. Um, so one of the extensions that I wish was enabled was this GPU utilization. So this it basically will help you see. Um, so let me show you. Uh, th this will basically demonstrate the uh, with a dashboard GPU utilization. So here we can do this um, on our uh, ourselves uh, by just creating a monitoring function. So you can monitor either using the system magic, uh, but obviously these are uh, just showing the information at that time. So uh, and and media simi basically shows you the GPU utilization. Um, to have this updated, we can write a code which basically runs this uh, all the time. So this is the code that uh, can run this. Um, and then if I display the system usage, you see that this is updated um, every second. Um, and this output is here. So one of the cool things about Jupyter Lab, I can basically assign this um, create new view for output. So I create a new view for this output and all the output will basically also be reflected here. So now I can go to my other Jupyter notebook. Uh, let's restart this one as well. And again, let's follow the practice of environment. Um, I don't need to run this cell. I don't need to run this up because I'm already displaying the output here. Uh, this Monai package is required for this example that I am trying. I, I already installed this. Um, then we have this part, which can take more than a minute because here we are importing various libraries. Um, and that can take some time. So let's wait when this finishes. Um, this is basically taking a lot of time because uh, all these packages are very involved packages that accesses various system directories in different file systems. And um, depending on how the uh, our file systems performance, this part can take some time. But this is a one-time cost that is very common in Python applications that you have to pay at the beginning of the application. So once this run, I again check the Torch version and CUDA version uh, so that I just make sure everything is running correctly. And then for this example, I need to have some uh, images. So these images I can download from here. This is a medical image uh, repository. Um, after that, is, I have already have this in a directory. I will specify the path. And then uh, I will run the uh, other cells and then run a training. So we can run this training on uh, either one GPU, two GPUs, or uh, four GPUs. Since we are on a single node, we can access a maximum four GPUs. Um, but this one is taking much longer than usual. Um, but at the end, I can just demonstrate what is a, the output that I got earlier. So basically it is seeing the GPUs and I start training, it sees all the four GPUs. And if it runs, we will see also GPU usage fire ups, uh, but we have to wait until this comes in. And doing this on Jupyter Lab, obviously you can run, submit this job on your notebook, but you can, for example, do this Try this on different number of devices. You can change um, the um, size of your batch and so on. So and see interactively the performance of the uh, training. So this is, I think, a good advantage of running a, a Jupyter Lab where you can interactively measure the performance or see if anything is wrong with your code. Okay, this part has run. So the rest will be rather quick. 
Uh, oops, I should not uh, run this. Let's stop this one. Uh, this is just going to get it. We don't need that. And these cells should run quickly. Okay, this is devices. This will run on one GPU. Let's make it four GPUs. And then let's start our trainer. So as you see, we can see our Jupyter uh, usage, uh, GPU usage is increasing. So almost. But you can also see that it is not utilized all the time, which is also a good sign that this um, training is not yet probably started. It is doing some pre-processing. Once the training starts, we have to see a higher usage um, of the GPUs. Uh, this is a very short run with four, uh, only two epochs. Um, anyhow, so this basically demonstrates uh, how you can play with uh, your training, see the performance, uh, and you can run many other things. You can look at the loss, you can look at the accuracy of whatever uh, you are, the metrics you are interested in, make a plot, and so on. So this is... Um, just one example of how you can use Jupyter Hub and Jupyter Notebook uh, and Jupyter Lab. So basically, Jupyter Lab has these Jupyter Notebooks available inside them um, and run a workflow. So I think this uh, concludes the live demonstrations. I will check if there are any questions. Um, so let me go back to the presentation. Um, so let's run the presentation. So I just want to go to the acknowledgement part. And I will uh, check for the, yeah, so um, we have done the live demo. Yes, this is, uh, this long queues is a problem. So some solutions that we are thinking about having a uh, Jupyter specific queue. So this long queue is the problem, especially with Polaris. Uh, you can in get into the debug queue, but it has a time limit of one hour. And if all the debug nodes, we have eight nodes available for debug. If all of them are filled, then you cannot get into that. And that can be frustrating. And even if you get into that, you have only one hour, that may not be enough. Uh, so we may have a Jupyter specific queue, which can access maybe only one single GPU as well, because most of the time it is enough for uh, data analysis. Um, and in the future, we might also have a specific data GPU or Polaris nodes uh, allocated for uh, Jupyter Hub. And Jupyter Lab extensions are not available on uh, only the widgets and pi, pi pigments are available on Jupyter Hub. Um, you cannot install your custom uh, extensions on Jupyter Hub yet, but these will be available in the future we are thinking about enabling um, uh, some popular extensions for all users. Yeah, um, I would like to thank you all for attending. Um, and uh, Tommy is basically the system admin that manages uh, Jupyter Hub server. And I would like to thank the ALCF Titan Group, Dick Benkad, and uh, Mike, ALCF director, for supporting uh, Jupyter applications.